It's now time for question period, and I recognize the member from Brampton Centre. Thank you, and uh, good morning, Speaker. My first question is to the Premier. As the Ford government scrambles to prepare the distribution of a COVID-19 vaccine, it's clear that if everything works out, it will still take months and months for them to be able to distribute it. Meanwhile, we are seeing record-breaking numbers of new COVID-19 cases throughout the province. Families need help today. But the Independent Financial Accountability Office reports that the government has been sitting on $12 billion in unspent COVID relief funds. Why is the Premier hoarding money and waiting for a vaccine instead of helping families who are managing this pandemic? Thank you. Over to the, well, to the President of the Treasury Board for a response. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you uh, to the member opposite for that question. Mr. Speaker, uh, numbers tell the story. Uh, the plan that was presented by the Minister of Finance in March of this year, uh, the Financial Accountability Officers uh, highlighted that we increased spending by $14.5 billion, 8.8% increase, Mr. Speaker. Uh, of course, we are going to do everything we can to protect the individuals and families and businesses in this province. We're seeing an unprecedented amount of spending. Uh, we are going to not relent until the job is done. We've unleashed an incredible amount of fiscal firepower against the, uh, uh, the COVID pandemic. And, Mr. Speaker, we aren't done yet. We're going to continue to do everything that it takes to protect the families, individuals, and businesses Response. of this province. Back to the member from Brampton Centre for next question. Thank you, Speaker. To quote one health expert on the government's uh, vaccine task force, um, vaccines will help, but it's going to be an ugly January. End quote. Working families in hotspots like Brampton can't sit back and just wait for a vaccine. Expert after expert has called for measures like paid sick days, a ban on evictions, capping our class sizes, and direct supports for small businesses hit by the lockdown. The billions of dollars that this government is sitting on could be put to work today. Why is the Premier refusing to consider measures like these and choosing instead to wait it out while he just conducts photo ops? Thank you. Back to the President of the Treasury Board for response. Mr. Speaker, uh we have to look at uh, not only the record $38.5 billion deficit uh, that was tabled by the Minister of Finance uh, in, uh, in, on November 5th to just see the number of uh, spending programs that we have, primarily in health and long-term care, in, uh, for small businesses, uh, supports and property tax, electricity. Mr. Speaker, that spending is up 7.6 per cent year over year, and in reference to the now $12 billion of money that we've set aside. Uh, I remember the opposition saying that uh, we had $9.3 billion and we weren't spending it. Well, the Minister of Finance tabled on November 5th that we had actually spent $6.7 billion of that $9.3 billion, Mr. Speaker. Prudence says that we should continue Response. to set aside money because we're not finished the battle against COVID-19 and we won't rest until the job is finished. Thank you. Back to the member from Brampton Centre for final supplementary. Speaker, it is fiscally and morally irresponsible for this government to be sitting on money while businesses go bankrupt, people in communities like Brampton and Scarborough are working every single day, and seniors continue to die in long-term care homes. Will the Premier admit that families need help today and that sitting back and just waiting for a vaccine is not a plan and start bringing in measures that families in this province desperately need to survive and help us stop the spread of COVID-19 here in Ontario. Thank you. Refer to the Premier for Through response. You, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the, the interim leader of the opposition uh, for, the, for the question. Um, you know, that, that's the difference between ourselves and the NDP and the Liberals. We actually have some money in contingency, 2.6 billion. It's, it's not accurate when they say 12 billion. That's all been allocated to the exception of 2.6 billion. Because as we've went through this pandemic, Mr. Speaker, we've seen things pop up. It's very fluid. It moves very quickly. And especially with the distribution coming up, the difference is they spend every single penny they have, then they come hat in hand looking for extra money, be it raising taxes, going to the federal government, 
We're being prudent fiscal managers with the taxpayers' money. We have $2.6 billion left. The rest has been allocated, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to be responsible right up to what they don't realize. Response? We have this money up to March the 31st. So rather than spend all the taxpayers' money up front and then start looking for more money, we're being fiscally prudent. Thank you. Next question. The member from Tamiskaming, Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. For seniors living in long-term care homes, waiting out the pandemic isn't an option. Claimed another 21 lives in the last 24 hours. And the second wave continues to ravage its way through long-term care homes. And the government has repeatedly promised a plan to increase frontline staff sometime in the new year. And the President of the Treasury Board just said the numbers tell a story. So perhaps the Premier could tell us how many frontline, extra frontline staff between the first wave, which caught us by surprise, and the second wave, which everyone knew was coming, how many extra frontline staff have actually been placed in homes to prepare for the second wave? How many? Tell us that story. Thank you. Uh, before we get the response, I just want to remind all members that you address your question through the chair, please. Thank you very much. Now I return to the Minister of Long-Term Care for response. Thank you. So, thank you, Speaker, and thank you for that question. Staffing, uh, you know, the, the legacy of the uh, staffing crisis that was left for us. Uh, to deal with and also on top of that the staffing issues with COVID. So this is something that it takes many variables to deal with. It depends on the number of residents in the home. It depends on the, the, uh, the level of care that is needed and, and we're working across ministries to address the staffing strategy long term as well as addressing the crises in our, in our homes right now. So this is a multi-pronged approach and the dollars uh, do speak for themselves. We started with $243 million to help with staffing and infection prevention and control. That was put out very quickly. And, and back in October, $540 million to address this. $405 million of that to address the issue with, with staffing. Uh, uh, another $30 million to allow more training for infection and prevention and control to enable our staff to, to be uh, safeguarded against COVID so that they can stay and work in our long-term care. Response? $61.4 million for capital repairs. $461 million for a wage increase to our frontline workers, $2.8 million for PPE, $19.4 million for direct care staffing, $10 million annual, to, and the list goes on and on. Thank you and very much. Thank you. Supplementary. Once again, to the Premier, through, the, through you, Speaker, the list goes on and on about program announcements, and, but the question was, how many actual people? Because they were short on people when the first wave hit, and shorter on people now, but you had time. Other provinces took steps, put staff in. The question, Speaker, is how many staff? How many staff? Not how many programs and how many millions and how many you've got in contingency, but how many people? Because we're talking about people dying in those homes. We're talking, and thank you for pointing at me, Speaker. We're talking about people dying in those homes and who were understaffed before. How many have you actually hired and put in those homes? You knew the second wave was coming. Thank you. Back to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the... the the question really, ultimately, that you have to understand what the level of, of, of number of residents in the home and what the situation is with the, the capacity in the homes. Our homes were at 99% capacity. Uh, when we started this uh, pandemic, there was not sufficient space uh, for uh, more additional residents, and that's why cohorting had to be addressed, infection prevention and control had to be addressed, and, and the homes, we heard very clearly from them that they needed space to be able to do that. And so the staffing ratio is very dependent. In terms of, of other, uh, other countries or other provinces, you know, I, I look at Quebec and what they did. 
And in fact, they have not been able to fulfill 10,000 spaces in what they said that they would do. So that is no fault of theirs. That is the conditions that they find themselves in COVID-19. We've taken a different approach, integrating our acute care sector, using community paramedics, using uh, the Canadian Red Cross when necessary, using uh, the supports that we have available to us. And our Thank homes you. are holding, and we're getting the care that they need to them, uh, along with the support in staff. It's on. Thank you very much. Back to the member for final supplement. 21 people died in long-term care yesterday. The minister is able to quote how many people in, that Quebec failed to hire, but she is not willing to say how many people Ontario actually added. And news of a vaccine isn't going to make COVID-19 disappear. Premier, seniors are still getting sick, and they're still dying. They're still waiting for four hours of hands-on care. They're still waiting for regular inspections, which aren't happening, happening either. The government seems to be more intent on saving money and waiting for a vaccine. How many people is the government prepared to risk while they sit on their contingency fund and hope to be able to roll out a vaccine? Thank you. To the Minister of Long-Term Care for a response. Thank you, Speaker. And I actually do reject uh, the premise of that question on so many levels. Our government has done nothing but support our long-term care system, rolling out dollars behind the policies, dealing with an unprecedented situation across the world. And my heart goes out to everyone who's been impacted by this, and the money is going out. And if we look at the dollars that have been spent, over a billion dollars already, and we've been very clear about the issues that have to be dealt with on an emergency basis, the stabilization of our homes, and then the long-term plan to address the neglected system of long-term care, whether it was in capacity, bed capacity, or whether it was in staffing, or, or whether it was in, in other areas. This is a, a, a sector that has been largely neglected. Our, what we promised uh, a staffing strategy in December, and that will be coming, and you will Response? hear about it. Uh, the dollars are there. Uh, and please understand that it is more than numbers. This is more about getting the, the, the support to our homes. Our homes are holding. We are getting uh, support and staff to the homes that are in crises. Uh, and, and this is happening. Thank we'll you. continue to support our long-term care homes. Thank you very much. Next question, the member from London West. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, Speaker, for months, health care professionals and public health experts have been calling for paid sick days in Ontario. Their calls are getting more urgent, and they have been joined by Ontario's big city mayors and GTHA mayors and chairs. Speaker, almost 60 percent of Ontario workers have no paid sick days, especially if they are low wage. These workers can least afford to lose a day of pay and are often at highest risk of COVID-19. People who don't have paid sick days are going to work sick, or they are sending their kids to school sick. They are putting off getting a COVID test because they simply cannot afford to lose their paycheck. Speaker, this afternoon I will introduce the Stay Home If You Are Sick Act to provide paid sick days and actually support First workers question. to stay home. Will the Premier commit right now to passing my bill? Thank you. Recognize the Minister of Labour, Training well, and Skills Development. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Look, uh, every single day uh, during this pandemic, we've been uh, protecting the health and safety of uh, workers uh, and the public at large. Mr. Speaker, that's why the very first initiative we passed here at Queen's Park, literally on day one of the pandemic, was Bill 186. I told any worker in this province that they can't be fired. Uh, because of COVID-19, if they're home in self-isolation, if they're in quarantine, if they're looking, looking after a, a son or a daughter, uh, they will not be fired for that. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, it was our government that eliminated the uh, need for sick notes uh, during COVID-19. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, we all should give credit to Premier Ford for leading the charge uh, across this country to ensure that $1.1 billion in paid sick days was delivered for the people of this province. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, it's not getting fired that workers are worried about. It's paying the rent. It's buying the groceries. It's paying the bills. Uh, 
Workers are put in an impossible position when they are expected to sacrifice their financial security in order to help slow the spread of COVID-19. Workplace outbreaks are on the rise because this government took away the paltry two paid sick days that used to be available to Ontario workers. Paid sick days don't just protect health, they are good for the economy. The Ontario Chamber of Commerce said this about my bill. When a worker protects themselves, they protect their colleagues and employer, and in turn, they safeguard the entire business. Speaker, this government has an opportunity to do something that will not only help businesses recover from COVID-19, but will strengthen our economy when the pandemic is over. I ask again, Question. will the Premier agree to pass my bill and provide permanent paid sick days for Ontario workers? Thank you. Back to the Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, uh, thanks to this Premier leading the charge across the country, there is uh, 10 paid sick days, uh, totaling $1.1 billion for the working people uh, of this province. Mr. Speaker, uh, Every level of government have worked uh, uh, together every day during this pandemic to protect the health and safety of uh, workers. But, Mr. Speaker, I have to ask the member opposite in her party, when did you abandon the working people of this province? For example, Mr. Speaker, if this budget passes that the finance minister tabled, we will have more health and safety inspectors than in the history of Order. this province. And you know what, Mr. Speaker, the NDP, the so-called uh, party of the working people, they've failed workers in this province. Again. Next question. The member from York Centre. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, we've seen great news this morning out of England and Scotland about vaccination administered to seniors and frontline health care workers. We know that Ontarians are waiting on Health Canada approval. Excuse me. Stop the clock. I'll give you a few extra seconds. I'm hearing a lot of chatter, loud chatter, coming from the opposition side right now. It's making it very difficult for me to hear the questions being asked by honourable members. So I would ask, use your inside voice <laughs> so we can all hear. I'm going to allow the member to start his question once again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, we've seen, a great, we've seen great news this morning out of England and Scotland about vaccination administered to seniors and frontline health care workers. We know that Ontarians are waiting on Health Canada approval of the Pfizer and BioNTech vaccine. Premier, our government has been advocating for Ontarians to receive our fair share of vaccinations and to receive them in a timely manner. Premier, can you please share what the federal government's announcement yesterday will mean for my constituents and all of Ontario? Thank you. To the Premier for a response. I want to thank the great member from York, York Centre. He's doing a great job there. As we get ready to receive the first shipments of COVID-19 vaccines, I'm glad to see, uh, after pushing the federal government, they're actually going to be distributed per capita right across this great uh, province. And our top uh, priority, Mr. Speaker, remains getting the vaccines out to the people who need it most, and we're going to do it as quickly as possible. Our first shipments are, are going to be in very small numbers, as everyone knows. But what we're waiting for, we're waiting for the millions and millions of vaccines that we can distribute. We have a phenomenal, phenomenal table uh, ready to distribute it. We have a great leader with General Hillier, and both the uh, Minister of Health and Solicitor General has been doing a great job too. So as soon as they land, we're going to be out the door for Response. the hardworking people of, of this great province. And Mr. Speaker, I'll, I'll leave with this note. We are the party for the working class. We are the party who represent the hard-working people, no matter if they're union or non-union. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Back to the member from York Centre. Thank you, Speaker, and back to the Premier. Ontario is ready to do its part, and will be ready to receive and distribute the first batch of vaccine when they arrive at our doorstep. So much work has already been done to date. The vaccination task force met, held its first meeting on Friday, another meeting over the weekend, and another meeting with Cabinet today. As General Hillier indicated, they've already run a tabletop exercise to look at how the vaccine rollout process would unfold and are coordinating with the Canadian Armed Forces 4th Division headquarters here in Toronto on the next steps in the planning process. Premier, could you please elaborate on the next key phases of the vaccination rollout and what that will mean for distribution priority? Thank you to the Premier Thank for member from York Centre. As General uh, Hillier said yesterday, Mr. Speaker, this is our mission. 
Our mission, we want to run an efficient and equitable COVID-19 vaccination program right across Ontario in order to provide every eligible person in the province the opportunity to voluntarily get vaccinated against COVID-19. And we believe that's going to be huge a way to help end this absolute tragedy that's been uh, facing the world and our, our province for over the last uh, close to a year. The vaccination task force under the command of General Hillier is taking prudent measures outlying three phases of deployment. In phase one, we want to deal with the vaccines that we know are coming in the first quarter of 2021, prioritizing uh, the vulnerable and health care workers. No one Response. is going to protect the, the most vulnerable more than our health care workers, and they're going to get vaccinated first. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member from Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Premier, under the cover of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Ford government has been quietly issuing a series of minister's zoning orders for projects that threaten the safety of Ontario's conservation lands. At least 19 of these orders are backed by developers that are PC party donors and close political allies of the Premier. Why, in the midst of a global pandemic, is the government allowing their donors and allies to build over protected conservation lands? Thank you. I recognize the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's disappointing when it comes to this issue, and NDP is totally out to lunch, Mr. Speaker. Every single MZO that has been issued. Uh, by the minister responsible has been at the request of the local municipality unless the lands were provincially owned. And I have mentioned this over and over in this House. I know the members opposite are having a hard time understanding and be pleased to draw it for them if it will make it easier, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, let me just list a few projects that the member opposite Butter. have opposed, Mr. Speaker. 3,700 long-term care beds, a new facility to build made in Ontario PPE, the expansion of Sunnybrook Hospital, 300 new supportive housing units, 1,000 new affordable homes, Mr. Speaker. Question. Doing Response. all of this, Mr. Response. Speaker, while creating 26,000 new jobs in Ontario. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we're proud of that one. Thank you. Supplementary question from the member from Niagara Centre. Again to the Premier, Speaker, that go the government member needs to acquaint himself with the facts. The government is lining the pockets of their donors and developer friends under the cover of a pandemic and hoping no one will notice. Over the weekend, seven members of the Ontario Greenbelt Council resigned in protest to this government's reckless attempt to undermine their mandate to protect the Greenbelt. If the government stands by these zoning orders, they should have no problem answering questions from the public on record. Will the government agree to a full review of these zoning orders by the Committee on General Government so we can hear from the Minister, the Premier and the insiders who this government keeps writing the rules for? Thank you. Back to the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite uh, for that question again, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if the NDP did a bit more research, they actually would find that these builders donated just as frequently, Mr. Speaker, to the oppositions, to the Liberal Party, to the NDP, that they did to the PC Party, Mr. Speaker. The people benefiting from these MZOs are Ontarians needing long-term care beds, Mr. Speaker, people out of work, nurses needing PPE, and restaurants needing to expand their outdoor patios, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned, every single MZO the minister has issued has been at the request of the municipalities unless the lands were provincially owned, Mr. Speaker. So I would encourage the member opposite to do his research, Mr. Speaker, before posing a question in this House I, and I am happy to sit with the member and go through all Response. of these projects and provide an explanation to him and make sure he understands the importance of these projects to Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Next question, 
Recognize the member from Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, in resigning from his role as chair of the Greenbelt Council, David Crombie, respected former federal progressive conservative cabinet minister, said this about Schedule 6 in Bill 229. He said, and I quote, it cuts out the heart of integrated watershed planning and management, severely cripples the conservation authorities in their historic stewardship of environmental issues, and now with the grossly expanded use of ministerial zoning orders and other procedural revisions, essential Order. public discussion and debate will be stifled or shut down, unquote. This legislation, Mr. Speaker, will certainly cause irreversible damage to wetlands, natural features, and will put the public at risk of increased flooding and environmental degradation without the protective check that conservation authorities have have provided. And with the amendments that the government has introduced, conservation authorities will be forced to allow development permits even in the face of contrary scientific evidence. Speaker, we know, coming, Speaker we know that Charles McVitie was the beneficiary of passage of Bill 213. Can the Premier share with the people of Ontario the names of the developers who support and will be the beneficiaries should 229 pass as it is currently written? Thank you. To the Premier for a response. Well, to you, Mr. Through you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the former uh, premier for the, for the question. I'd just like to know when she changed the green belt 17 times, what developers was she helping? 17 times. I can tell you, Mr. Premier. I mean, uh, Mr. Speaker, I have yet to touch the green belt. Unlike the former premier that wanted to take care of all her buddies and all her development buddies by changing it seven times. And then the new leader decides to build a pool in his backyard, as I mentioned yesterday, Mr. Speaker, to ignore the Conservation Authority when we're putting $30 million into making sure that we protect wetlands, protect the green belt, unlike the previous government that didn't even put close to that into uh, protecting it. Response? All they wanted to do is line the pockets of all their buddies 17 times. Mr. Speaker, one side of the road, a farmer's worth $50 million. On the other side of the road, he's struggling to pay the bills because of the former premier playing games with the green belt. We aren't going to play you. games. We're protecting the green belt. Thank you very much. Supplementary question back to the member from Don Valley Thank West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I heard this um, this response yesterday. And Mr. Speaker, my recollection, I was also Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and then I was Premier. And those 17 adjustments, Mr. Speaker, they were adjustments to the boundary. We had, I believe, over 600 requests, Mr. Speaker. Over 600 requests for adjustments. We made. 17 minor adjustments, Mr. Speaker. I think it is legitimate that when a government puts a policy in place, we created the green belt. It is only reasonable to make adjustments if there were mistakes. I'm the first to admit there were mistakes made in some cases. But with over 600 requests, Mr. Speaker, 17 adjustments, I think that's pretty reasonable. On the CBC this morning, the minister noted that the increased use of MZOs did not pertain to the Green Belt and that the use of MZOs is driven by municipalities. Speaker, the MZOs and decisions that degrade source Question. water protection outside the Green Belt will affect the land inside the green belt mr speaker water flows mr yeah. speaker there were plans in place to expand the green belt in thank Waterloo, you the paris galt moraine there thank you very much why have those plans thank not you been followed, mr. Speaker? to the premier for response through, through you mr speaker i remember everyone in this house remembers the time that they were selling access every single minister had their quota $10,000 a table, and maybe that was part of the 17 minor changes to support their developer buddies. You buy the table, we'll give you a little bit of the green belt off. That's the real story. Mr. Speaker, our government doesn't do that. We aren't going to do that. We aren't touching the green belt. We said we weren't going to touch it. We support the green belt. We're pouring money into the green belt and the watershed to make sure that that is taken care of, Mr. Speaker unlike the previous government that was selling access, how many tables you want, and we'll fix you up with the green belt. Not a problem at all. 17 times it happened. It's not going to happen under our watch, Mr. Speaker. Just before we get to the next question, listen, I know that it's getting close to Christmas and you have visions of sugar plums dancing in your head, but I'm going to ask you to kind of keep the excitement level down so that we can hear uh, with, the, uh, with the members, their questions and their responses. So thank you for that. And now I return to the member from York Centre for question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
My question is to the Minister of Education. Speaker, this has been a year we'll never forget. In the spring, we saw the impact of not having schools open, be it the effect on children, parents, or educators. In August, our government revealed its back-to-school plan, fully endorsed by the Chief Medical Officer of Health, to allow for in-class learning to resume. We're now in December, and we've seen a remarkable effort by everyone involved in Ontario's education system to create a safe and positive environment in which students can learn. Could the minister please share with us what efforts have been taken to date to get us to where we are today? Thank you very much. I turn over to the Minister of Education for thank you very response. Much, I want to thank the member from York Centre for the question. Mr. Speaker, it has been an unprecedented year, and amid this difficulty in this province, we have two million children learning safely in Ontario under a plan fully endorsed by the Chief Medical Officer of Health of this province. Mr. Speaker, as was mentioned earlier by the Treasury Board President, numbers matter. $1.4 billion of investment, 3,000 new teachers hired in this province, 1,300 more custodians, 600 additional mental health workers, EAs and ECEs, an additional 625 public health nurses, more than doubling the allocation for our schools, 130 1,000 more computers, 19,000 more portable HEPA filters, 2,500 portable ventilation devices. Mr. Speaker, this plan, endorsed by the Chief Medical Officer of Health, fully funded by this province, has helped ensure 99.9% .9 of our students remain safe. Over four out of five schools do not have COVID at all. This is why we face rising community transmission. And the light in the darkness and the difficulty we face in this pandemic is Response. the incredible heroism, the hard work and determination of our teachers, of our staff and our parents, for which this province is extremely grateful of and proud of. Thank you. Back to the member from York Centre for a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And back to the minister. The minister is right. Keeping our schools open is a societal imperative, which this pandemic has taught us time and time again. The pandemic forced all of us and our education system to adapt to circumstances beyond our control. Can the minister please share with us what efforts are being made as staff and students are planning a return to school in January? Thank you to the Minister of Education for response. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. If indeed, we are looking forward to protecting the progress made in this province, recognizing fully with rising community transmission the challenges imposed within our schools. But having said that, Speaker, we are committed to doing everything possible to keep our schools open. It is a societal imperative. It is so important to the mental health and development of our children, and I think for parents as well. That's why we are uh, looking to continue on with asymptomatic testing in schools in the new year in those high-risk regions. We're launching a COVID safety refresher course on the first day back as a compulsory learning for all students on the protocols to ensure that they understand them and adapt to them. We're adding an additional $380 million that we will unlock and we will announce in the new year to further protect schools, to hire more staff, to ensure more distancing, to ensure we have the technology to give every student universal access to learning both online and in class. We are taking action Response. following the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. I want to reaffirm, Speaker, my gratitude to everyone working together, public health and school boards, collaborating in the interest of keeping kids learning and keeping them engaged in school. Thank you very much. Next question, I recognize the member from... Hamilton it's West. a long one, I know, I know. Hamilton, no, it's not Hamilton East, is it? No, it's, no, West. Hamilton West, Ancaster, Dundas. Speaker, um, so today, my question is for the Premier. Today we learned from the FAO that in the middle of the worst crisis our province has ever seen, during a brutal second wave of a virus that's devastating our hospitals, our long-term care homes, our economy, and impacting every single aspect of all of our lives, this Conservative government and the Premier are sitting on $12 billion of un unallocated and unspent money. The question is simple, Mr. Speaker. How can this Premier and his ministers sleep at night knowing that they could have kept people safe, but they chose not to? Yeah. I recognize the, uh, minister, or the uh, President of the Treasury Board for a response. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, uh, the question is simple. The answer is simple. $14.5 billion of increased spending since March of this year, Mr. Speaker. And you talked about health, and, and you know, we, we aren't sleeping because we're going to work tirelessly 24-7 to get this job done. And let me just highlight some of the where that money is going. 80% of those unallocated funds have been uh, earmarked for health care and other funding. Let me give you some examples. 
uh, through our Ministry of Health and our great Minister of Health, $351 million for 2,250 additional beds. Uh, over a quarter billion dollars, $284 million to deal with the surgical backlog, Mr. Speaker, $70 million for additional flu vaccines, $572 million to further support hospitals. Mr. Speaker, as I've said, when you uh, have Response. a crisis like this, we will not rest until all the people of Ontario, families and businesses are safe and we get to the other side of this terrible pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Back to the member from Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I do have to say thank goodness uh, for our independent officers like the, the FAO, because it's the only way we're getting any transparency from this government. Because for weeks now, members on that side of the House have been howling yeah. every time we mentioned that they were choosing to sit on $9.3 billion in unspent money. And Mr. Speaker, that's billions that could have saved lives. They heckled and they spun and they tried to tell us that they weren't sitting on any money at all, that it was just fear-mongering. Now we know, thanks to the FAO, the government wasn't just sitting on $9.3 billion. It turns out the real number, Mr. Speaker, is actually $12 billion. What does that side of the House have to say for themselves now? Why weren't the thousands of people who died in this crisis worth the money? To the President of the Treasury Board for response. Mr. Speaker, uh, I do reject the premise of that statement. Uh, we have been working tirelessly, and the numbers show it. I mean, the $9.3 billion contingency that uh, we set aside as the Minister of Finance uh, tabled in the budget in November showed that over $6 billion was spent in that period. Uh, Mr. Speaker, when you have a $38.5 billion deficit plan for this year, you are spending money. Mr. Speaker, we're going to direct those very dear funds to the people that need it most in this province. But we, as the Premier said, we're going to have a little bit left over because we don't know exactly what's around the corner. So 80% have been allocated. We have another 20%. And we're going to support the Minister of Health, the Minister of Long-Term Care, the Solicitor General, uh, all aspects of our of response to this pandemic. And we won't rest, Mr. Speaker, until everyone response. is safe in this province. Thank you. Further questions? I recognize the member from Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Rolling out the COVID-19 vaccine to 14.5 million Ontarians is going to be a great challenge. The health of all Ontarians and Ontario's economy depend on it. The government struggled with this year's rollout of the flu vaccine. It was a major pillar in their second wave. Too many Ontarians who wanted it didn't receive it. That simply can't be the case with COVID-19. I put a forward a motion for this House to be debated later this afternoon with the intention of ensuring that the government's adequately prepared for the task, that there be clear and transparent communication throughout the rollout of the plan, and that there be some legislative oversight. So, Speaker, through you to the Deputy Premier, will the government be supporting my motion this afternoon? Thank you. I recognize the Deputy Premier. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. What I can certainly advise you is that, first of all, with respect to the flu campaign, it was the most successful flu campaign that we've had in Ontario's history, to the point that we've just recently purchased another 200,000 doses of flu mist from AstraZeneca to make sure that all the people in Ontario that want to receive the flu vaccine will be able to do that. The COVID vaccine is, is a mammoth task. There's no question about that. It's going to be the most important vaccination campaign in in probably Ontario's history, but we have key people there that are supporting it. The Solicitor General and I are the ministers that are responsible. We have General Hillier leading up our task force. General Hillier has people on the task force that have combined knowledge and experience in both um, information technology, in uh, uh, epidemiology, all of the others that Response. are really important for this to be rolled out properly. And there's no question that we will be ready as soon as those flu vaccines are ready to be shipped. We will be dealing with them and getting them into people's arms as quickly as possible. Thank you. Back to the member from Ottawa South for supplementary questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I was just speaking about the everyday experience of people in my riding and other people's ridings as well, too, in with regards to the flu vaccine. So, and I think I speak on behalf of all members of this House to say that we want you to be successful. We want you. It's so important to the health and safety of all of our communities. And we know that first, uh, high-risk Ontarians need to be first in line. It's very important. And we know the government got a general. 
but you need an army. And regional leadership is critical in this because Ontarians will need clear and consistent communications to know what to expect. That means setting targets and showing your progress. And we have a committee established in this legislature for emergency management oversight. And the most important thing in emergency management right now is the distribution of this vaccine. So, Speaker, through you to the minister. Question. Will you commit to appearing or a designate appearing before the Select Committee on Emergency Management Oversight on a regular basis? We're going to be away from here for two and a half months. That's a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Your Deputy Premier. Thank you. Well, what I can assure the member is that there will be open and transparent communication with respect to uh, plans for the distribution of the flu vaccine. You're absolutely right. It is vitally important for everyone in Ontario to know what the plan is and how things are moving along. But I can tell you we've had several meetings already with the task force. They're continuing to meet. They have three virtual half-day meetings a week. This is something that we need to deal with immediately because it sounds as if we may be receiving some of the vaccines uh, slightly earlier earlier than we expected, but have no fear. We will be ready. We have the right people in place. We have the plan in place. And as soon as that, those vaccines arrive, they're going to be distributed and to be dealt with and uh, given into the arms of the people who are most vulnerable. People are seniors living in congregate care settings, long-term care homes, the staff, Response. people in First Nations and other communities that are in need, as well as people receiving chronic home health care. I don't think there's any concern about the question that these people need to be first, and they will be, but we will be giving regular communications to the people of Ontario about how the plan is moving through. Thank you. Next question. The member from York Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. In my riding of York Centre and across the province, jobs in the skilled trades are and will continue to be in high demand for years to come. The most recent data shows that one in three journey persons are over the age of 55. Mr. Speaker, projections prior to the pandemic demonstrated that the construction sector alone will need an additional 22,000 workers in anticipation of the shortage of skilled and trained workers. To the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development, what action is our government taking to prevent these shortages and support the skilled trades? Recognize the Minister of Labour. Well, thank you uh, very much, and I want to thank the honourable member from York Centre for his strong advocacy to get more young people uh, into the skilled trades. Mr. Speaker, it is true we anticipate uh, shortages in the skilled trades over the next several years here in Ontario. That is why our government is taking immediate action to promote and recruit more young people, women, Indigenous people, and veterans into these meaningful and well-paying careers. Mr. Speaker, I recently joined the Associate Minister of Women's Issues in London to announce the new group sponsorship grant. We are investing $20 million to help small and medium-sized businesses share the cost of managing and training new apprentices. And Mr. Speaker, I look forward to sharing more about our government's mission to reform the skilled trades and get more young people into the skilled trades in my supplementary. Thank you. Back to the member from York Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. It's great to hear that our government is taking the skilled trades shortage seriously and active, acting decisively to tackle it. The skilled trades are crucial to our economic recovery. When you have a trade, you have a job for life. Mr. Speaker, recently I was disappointed to hear that only 6% of businesses are taking on apprentices. We know that Ontario businesses want to step up, but they need our help. Can the minister please tell the House how this new grant will further support employers in recruiting and training of new apprentices. Back to the Minister of Labour. Great. Well, thank you uh, very much, and thank you to the member for that uh, question again. Uh, Mr. Speaker, a $20 million investment will reduce pressure on any one employer to see an apprentice through to completion of their training. Now, a group of local businesses, for example, can work together to train six to 12 apprentices and receive around $125,000, uh, up to $250,000. This will increase the overall number of people training and working in the skilled trades. And, Mr. Speaker, it will expose apprentices to a wider range of skills and work experience. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to connecting people with lifelong careers that provide for them and their families and build stronger communities for all of us. Thank you. Next question.
The member from Muskegua. No, Kiwetnu. There we go. Good morning, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, uh, yesterday the Auditor General reported that Indigenous peoples, our nations, uh, are not engaged in the development of government programs and policies that impact us. When I see that happening, uh, that is racism, oppression, and colonialism in action. And we see it, playing it played, being played out on the lives and the health of people of Niskanaga who have no access to clean drinking water. Speaker, Niskanaga needs to be, needs uh, the Premier to be part of the solution. They need clean drinking water now. Is the Premier's help on the way today or, uh, or uh, for the people of Niskanaga? Thank you. Recognize the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Energy, Indigenous Northern Affairs. Development and Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much for the, the question. As the, the member pointed out, the Auditor General's report has taken a look at how Indigenous Affairs can be incorporated throughout all of our ministries, and we've embarked on that process of making sure that all ministries are working together. It was one of the things that we talked about when we were first elected, how many ministries were acting as silos, and those silos need to be broken down, and we have embarked on that process to do that. With respect to clean drinking water at the community that the member was speaking about, we have been involved with that. The Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, their Indigenous uh, drinking water team has been involved from the very beginning, and we believe that the federal government has it now in place, and the testing will be completed very shortly Response. so that there will be clean drinking water. Thank you. Back to the member from Kiewetnu. Uh, it seems that uh, the Ministry of Indigenous Affairs has been MIA in our communities. Um, but back to the Premier, with this global pandemic hurting the economy, uh, we understand and we hear that the development of the far north is an essential part of the government's recovery plan. Speaker, uh, I want to be clear. Without respect for Treaty No. 9 and the support for Niskanaga's basic human rights, this government has no right to request development on our treaty territories. The chief of Niskanaga wrote the premier this week for his commitment in helping to access clean drinking water as human beings, Ontarians, and treaty rights holders. Will the premier meet the Nis with Niskanaga Question. to discuss their nation's access to clean drinking water? Thank you. Back to Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's my understanding, and working directly with the federal government on it, that the testing should be completed on December the, the 14th of the clean water facility there, and that we're, our expectation is that clean drinking water will be available very, very shortly to the entire community. We thank all of the partners who have worked together to make sure that this is something that is completed, but I do have to remind the member that it was the federal government that put the $16 million in to build it. They did not have it completed appropriately, and the provincial government stepped forward with the Clean Drinking Water Task Force to make sure that we were getting it right so that those people could have clean drinking water. Further to that, the provincial government did its part to make sure that those individuals had a safe environment Response. to live in the meantime while we looked after the evacuation of the community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Next question, the member from Guelph. Good morning, Speaker. Thank you. My question is for the Premier. Every prominent stakeholder in the province of Ontario, except for a handful of development industry lobbyists, have unanimously asked for Schedule 6 to be removed from Bill 229. But instead of listening to the people, the government introduced amendments that gave the minister even more power to ignore science and run roughshod over responsible planning. Yesterday, the Minister of the Environment in a media article said that he thought it would be excellent for democracy to have more debate and consultations on CAs. 
I agree before we pass Schedule 6. I agree. So, Speaker, why is the Premier hell-bent on continuing to rush this ill-conceived schedule Question. through an unrelated budget bill against the will of the people of this province? Will he listen to his own minister, remove Schedule 6, because we need more consultation on the changes to CAs? Thank you. Oh, I recognize the uh, parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, over the past few years, as, as the member knows, conservation authorities were getting into all kinds of things like zip lining and photography. And, and the member knows how important it is to focus on flood mitigation, which is why that's uh, the changes we made uh, brought them back to their core mandate on source water protection, flood mitigation, and natural hazards. And the member also talks about amendments. And yes, Speaker, amendments were made in order to uh, take into account natural hazards. And in fact, over the last now, uh, they the conservation authorities actually have more uh, enforcement power with a stop work uh, order when it comes to natural hazards, and that's actually more enforcement that they've had in the last 70 years, Speaker. It was in the bill originally, but the Liberal government never actually uh, proclaimed it, and it's this government that proclaimed it and giving more conservation authorities the, uh, the tools they need in order to protect the environment. But, Speaker, the member also talks about no support, and I will talk about the Ontario's Far Farmers Network that Response? said these changes are all Order. I will talk about Ducks Unlimited, London. Uh, we also have uh, here in Perth Landowners Association and Ontario Stone, Sand and Gravel Association, Ontario Fruit and Vegetable Growers, and I can name many more Thank people who are in support of these changes. Thank you. Back to the member from Guelph for a supplementary question. Yeah, I'd like to remind the member opposite that the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, the big city mayors, literally the people who represent the local elected leaders who literally represent everybody in this province along with conservation authorities have said that what this government do is doing is reckless it's going to cost us more in the long run so i want to ask a question that came to me directly from the cfo of the toronto region conservation authority speaker if the province is going to force conservation authorities to issue permits for development in environmentally sensitive areas that are in contravention to their science-based watershed approach to decision making are they going to Question. indemnify conservation authorities against the repercussions of future impacts of these developments including flooding because there is no mention of this in schedule six and there is substantial risk being forced on to cas due to this thank you thank you back to the parliamentary assistant to the minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, let me read you a quote by the Mayor of Windsor. And he says, lots of mayors, myself included, as part of the Ontario Big City Mayors, have issues with conservation authorities and the power given to them and that the delays and ad that add significant costs to projects, often without much material benefit. Please tell the Minister of Environment know that these changes need to be made. Uh, Speaker, the changes we're making uh, get to make sure that conservation authorities are focused on their core mandate. Many of them are doing good work, but frankly, some of them are more focused on zip lining than there are on flood mitigation and natural hazards. Again, we're giving them the tools to do this, and this is being supported by the Simcoe County Federation of Agriculture, the Ontario Farmers Network, right Northumberland Federation of Agriculture, and I can name more. And in fact, the Auditor General in her report yesterday, if the member read it, page, pages 40, 243 to 269, also mentioned, uh, and she followed up on her previous Auditor General report in 2008, that said there needs to be changes to conservation authorities on transparency. Spot accountability and we're doing just that. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member from Muskegon, James Bay. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier. While English and French are official languages in courts in Ontario, French language access is still an utopia in certain regions. Last week in Hearst, a resident couldn't be served in his native language in Sault Ste. Marie. She had a hard time to speak and understand English, but this lady had to appear in a video conference only in English. Could the Premier tell us why in 2020 it is impossible to have French language services in Ontario tribunals? 
for response. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and I'm pleased to have the question. It is a very, very important topic and something that we're actively working on. I, I wonder if maybe he's been speaking to some of some of my officials who, who know that we're working on some pieces that I hope to be able to to uh, bring forward publicly soon. It's a very important, it's a very important piece that, that people can access uh, the justice system in their, in, their, uh, in their language of choice of the official languages in Ontario. And again, I, I look forward to uh, ex acknowledging publicly uh, some changes that are in the works and uh, to move us forward in that regard. It's long overdue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Back to the member from Muskegon, James Bay for supplementary. Let the Minister for Francophone Affairs keeps telling us that we have a pilot project for French language services in tribunals in Sudbury. She's repeated it in September, in December, telling us that we're, but still we're facing a failure, a failure of some of a lady who couldn't do her tell her story in her uh, native language mr speaker because there was no interpreters the case has been cancelled in november 2019 and the victim could not even tell her story will the premier admit once and for all that there are failures in the francophonie and that there should be French language services access in the legal services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and uh, I'm proud to stand with my colleague, the Minister of Francophone Affairs, who was the previous AG and set in motion a number of very positive changes to catch us up on the neglect that was, was in place by the Liberals for 15 years, Mr. Speaker, with, with no regard for the people of Ontario who speak French as their, as their primary language. And so, Mr. Speaker, we need to move this forward, and we are moving this forward, and I am really looking forward to being able to announce in the very near future some very positive changes with more to come, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question, the member from Scarborough, Guildwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This morning, the FAO released its expenditure monitoring tracking provincial spending, which revealed that contrary to the government's pandemic insistence, pedantic ins insistence, that they have not spent unallocated funds. Quite the opposite. The balance in unallocated funds have actually increased. Speaker, thousands of Ontarians are going to stay home away from their families this holiday season because the government failed to flatten the second wave curve. Speaker, they had the funds. They were given the funds by the federal government. They did not ramp up testing and contact tracing in the summer when they knew the second wave was coming. They did not invest in schools uh, to make them safe places for learning for education workers and students. They did not shore up COVID hotspot communities like my riding of Scarborough, Guildwood, and Brampton, and Windsor. Speaker, Question. does the Premier think it's appropriate to sit on billions of dollars in funds while millions of Ontarians are in lockdown. Thank you. <laughs> Recognize the President of the Treasury Board for response. Well, Mr. Speaker, thank you to the member opposite for that question, but clearly she has her numbers wrong. Let me tell you, this is the same member who said that the $9.3 billion that we set aside, that we weren't spending any of it. She said we were spending zero. We actually spent over $6 billion of it. It's only prudent to set aside more money. Mr. Speaker, because now we're up to almost $12 billion in set-asides. Why? Of which 80 per cent has been spent. 80 per cent. Mr. Speaker, she referenced testing. $1.4 billion in additional COVID testing in the last six months of this fiscal year alone. The Minister of Education mentioned, uh, thank you for mentioning some numbers, uh, Minister of Education, $1.3 billion in additional funding for education to keep our children safe and our teachers safe. Mr. Speaker, we also put in another billion dollars, additional money into Spons? personal protective equipment. Mr. Speaker, the numbers tell the story. The money is being spent, and we're very proud of what we're doing. Thank you. Back to the member from Scarborough, Guildwood, for supplementary question. Speaker, we're going to have to disagree with the numbers. Right as the second wave was heating up, the government underspent by $278 million in public health. That's almost $300 million that could have been used to ramp up 
contact tracing and testing efforts. They had underspent by an even greater $477 million in post-secondary education. This is in the face of deep cuts to OSAP while students are accumulating more debt to pay their tuitions. Despite the, t the title of their budget speaker, the government has pinched pennies to the tune of $12 billion instead of investing to protect and to support Ontarians. This inertia is unconscionable. Speaker, through you, Question. when will the Premier stop being cheap in the pandemic, or is this going to be where he gives Ontarians a lump of coal this Christmas with a post-COVID bump in cases? Thank you. Back to the uh, President of the Treasury Board. Mr. Speaker, we're hoping to give all Ontarians a vaccine for this Christmas, Mr. Speaker. You know, that's what we're planning to do. Mr. Speaker, it's, it's interesting coming from uh, the uh, member opposite who increased the debt by $200 billion of the previous government and had a qualified opinion from the uh, Auditor General for a number of years. We've had three years of clean opinions. Mr. Speaker, the FAO report that she references indicates that spending this fiscal year from March to now, we've revised up by $14.5 billion, Mr. Speaker, 8.8% as well year over year, up 7.6%. I don't know about your math, but my math says that that's an increase and we are spending Response. the money. And the Auditor General and all the other officials are supporting us on this, Mr. Speaker. We won't stop working hard on behalf of the individuals and the families of this great province to keep them safe. Thank and you. We'll continue working. Thank you. Next question. The member from Toronto, St. Paul. Thank you, Speaker. Elaine in my community is terrified. Her grandmother lives at Rose of Sharon, the only Korean long term care home in Ontario. It's non profit. And now it's being taken over by Rika Care Centers, a for profit. And she is worried. Uh, there are over 20,000 signatures signed on this. And the question to the Premier is Will the Premier commit today to stop the long term care license transfer application of Rose of Sharon, Korean non profit long term care, to for profit? Rika Care Centre, which has multiple lawsuits and is for profit and has had many deaths during COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Recognize the Minister of Long Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for raising your concern. Uh, our priority as a government is the, the safety and well-being of residents and staff and, and families involved with long-term care. There is no doubt about that. Uh, this situation is, uh, is uh, under review and we're considering it. Thank you. Thank you. Time for question period. It's come to an end. <laughs>